Hi guys, uh, I'm Kai, host of the Coral System, and I am back to do a video on covert DID. Now, what covert DID is, there's usually, now, you aren't going to really see it in like the DSM-5, but what there is, it's, it's kind of like breaking it up into two separate sections, covert and more overt. Overt DID is where the media shows a lot of very obvious switches or very different obvious flamboyantly different alters and covert DID is more hidden. Now one would think that covert DID would be more rare. Honestly it's mostly the norm. Now both can be common but media representation plays a big part of it and more focus gets on to overt DID because most people who do not have DID thinks it's cool to see the difference, where not a lot of attention gets put on covert DID, and a lot of times covert people with covert D more covert symptoms get misdiagnosed. It's actually very common for people with DID to get misdiagnosed first. So I'm going to be talking about my experiences with it. Sorry, I play with my hair a lot when I'm nervous. Um, I'm going to be talking about my experiences with having covert DID, and it led to me being misdiagnosed a lot over my life, a very large time. I'm, ni I'm 19 years old now, and I have just been diagnosed with DID for almost a year now. Before then, I went through almost every other diagnosis in the book <laughs> besides DID. But some of my more, more common experiences with it was um, it started with zoning out. I have, I'm neurodivergent, I have autism, and so it's been very easy for me to dissociate from a young age. And what dissociating is, it's zoning out. I talked about it a bit in my last video if you want to check it out. And I've always struggled with it all my life. It was very easy to make myself dissociate. It was I was dissociating a lot. I have a lot of gaps in my childhood from it. So it was very common for me to just think it was normal. Um, I had a lot of issues with derealization. And what derealization is, it's kind of being separated from reality. And not in a way where it's like psychosis. It feels like you're in a video game. It feels like your whole world is going around you and it doesn't quite feel real. You know what's going on. You know exactly what's going on. And you know in a part of your head that it is real, but it just doesn't feel like you're connected to it. And a similar stance is depersonalization, where you feel that about yourself. Depersonalization is very common when you're in derealization, especially when you're in a trauma moment. And you just don't quite feel like yourself is real. Like you look in a mirror and you look and you're just like, that's not quite me. Or almost like an out-of-body experience. Not like you're looking at yourself in the third person, but more you're looking at yourself and you don't feel quite connected to who you are and to the body. You also, I also have struggles with looking back and missing time. Um, I don't remember all of... I don't remember a lot of high school. I know I was in a psych ward in and out a lot of times and I don't remember my stay there. I remember stories but I don't remember it. Um, other alters have varying degrees where they don't remember years. I have issues where I don't remember years too. I have bits and pieces from before I was 13 but most of it are tiny tidbits not exactly there and sometimes if an altar is close I remember more memories but then I can lose them again or sometimes I'll be losing memories and then I'll regain them later I also have small little details missing like I'll be sitting there and realize have I eaten I don't remember if I ate dinner or I'll be sitting there watching a movie and I'll realize, I'll look back and I'm just like, oh, it's at the 45 minute point. What happened? And I'll have to rewind and watch it again and again because I don't remember. 
Also, um, a lot through my childhood, I was labeled a liar. And you might think it's because I lied. Well, technically I did. <laughs> but also technically I didn't. I would go get into fights and it was when I was switching out and I didn't know it. And I would say something or I would do something like, um, I'll give you an example. One time I did, my mom asked me to do the dishes and we got into a fight and I called her a very rude word, which I didn't mean. And when she came to talk to me about it later, she tried talking to me and I told her I never did that. I would never say that. Well, I did, but and I was technically sitting there, like, telling her, lying to her in her eyes, lying to her that I didn't do it, when in reality, I was telling my truth. It might not be reality's truth of what happened, but I was telling my truth. And it happens a lot. Actually, I know of a lot of people with DID who are labeled liars <laughs> and have a lot of these issues where getting into fights because... You don't understand what's going on. You don't understand why this person is saying, you're saying you're doing something when you didn't do it. Or finding out that my partner the other night saw me like at three in the morning uh, making some pasta. I don't remember it, but it's just those little things that you don't really think of. Um, you also, a lot of times, have amnesia of amnesia, where your brain doesn't want you to remember or to realize what's going on. So it will kind of fill in the gaps so you don't realize time is missing. Uh, random changes of interest was a big thing for me, and it was a big indicator of why people thought I had borderline personality disorder because I would go from loving to ice skating and to thinking it was the greatest thing in the world to all of a sudden just not being interested in it. And it was because different alters and even they can influence you. They don't have to be completely out to still influence your day-to-day -day life. My dog is turning around. You good? Good boy, sorry. <laughs> Also, gender crises. I know I am non-binary. I am transgender and identify as non-binary. But I will have time that goes by where I'll feel like a girl or that I'll feel like a boy. And it happens a lot. I remember when I was a kid, I knew I was non-binary. But then in high school for almost a year, I identified as a guy and I knew I wanted to transition fully to a guy. And then I went back to feeling like a girl and then realizing, when I realized there was more of us, I kind of put the pieces together of what was going on. But it can be common. I identified as gender fluid for two years because of it. Because my gender would fluctuate all the time and I realized it was because I was being influenced. But, um, dissociative fugue. Now, not everyone has dissociative fugue issues. Um, for me, it personally only happened to me twice, and it was when I was in college, and I wasn't, like, around people, so there wasn't really a huge issue with them having to hide, but, um, what, what dissociative fugue is, is kind of the whole DID, like, stigma where people think everything happens, it's waking up and not in a random place, not knowing where you are. Well, yes, it does happen. But it doesn't happen as much as people make it out to be. Um, for me, it happened twice in college. And once I literally just woke up and it was me taking a walk and sitting in the dorm room in the uh, lobby and just reading and just sitting there at like three in the morning. Another time, it was a similar situation where I was also in the dorm and I was just walking around campus. I wasn't doing anything. And it can cause issues. Like I'm not saying it's the safest thing in the world to do. It's definitely something to watch out for, but it's not as huge of a common issue as people make it out to be. Now every system is different. For me, thankfully, I never really had to worry about it as much. For me, it's more amnesia and dissociation. Physical symptoms is another one people don't think about as much. 
Um, there is talk a lot about, oh, different alters can have different physical symptoms. That is accurate. I have one alter that when they switch out, they can take an eye exam test and they are legally blind. They have worn my partner's glasses and seen perfectly through them. I need glasses. Luckily, I'm not that bad yet, <laughs> although my eyes are deteriorating. Also, um, sorry, notification on my phone. Also, um, you can have different vari variations of different conditions that might help you in a way. Like if you saw really horrible trauma, an alter might make you blind or uh, not necessarily blind, but they might affect the part of your brain that you can see. So they might affect it so you can't see as a result. Same thing with if you have a condition, other alters can be better or worse. I have the worst of the autism in my entire system. Besides one alter who is completely nonverbal. I'm semi-verbal, but cognitively, I have the worst cognitive issues out of all of us. <laughs> Which I don't know why I'm the host, but apparently they just wanted it that way. Um, also, my physical issues with my spine... I am, I need a wheelchair, but I can still walk around sometimes. I have another alter that can walk a bit better than me and not have as extreme issues. And I have another alter that's worse than me and completely is not, cannot walk at all. Now, the body definitely does need the wheelchair, <laughs> but it's just how physical things and even mental things can present. Different mental functionings and abilities and different physical functioning and abilities. Um, hearing voices. That one is tricky. When people think of DID and hearing voices, they mostly think, oh, like a hallucination. Not always. Now, DI, some systems with DID can hear voices and see things. That is definitely a possibility. Even in the DSM, it does say that comorbidly, you can have symptoms that kind of aligns with psychosis. That is a possibility. Usually when we talk about hearing voices, it's not like that. When you're reading a book, you know how you can hear it in your own voice, kind of internally? Well, it's kind of like that, except that monologue, an internal monologue, is in different voices. And sometimes you can hear it, sometimes you can't. Me personally, with my covertness, I can't hear them. I can't hear them. Uh, they just kind of take over and do things, but I, I don't have as much, I don't have communication. They don't write back to me because they want to stay hidden. They don't talk as much. Sometimes once in a while they do, but usually they don't talk. And it can be challenging because you look in the media and you see what appears to be all these symptoms systems, DID systems, OSDD systems, and them being able to communicate and talk and have great, like, relationships with their systems. And then you sit there and you don't have that. I have to live life going around, not knowing really what's going on, not being able to communicate with them, and it kind of sucks longing for a relationship that for you might not happen and it's definitely not talked about enough especially since covertness is so common also emotional amnesia is a big thing now emotional amnesia is so do you know how when like there's different types of flashbacks that you can have with ptsd and some of them is emotional flashbacks where it's not necessarily you're seeing the trauma like a movie, but you're feeling the same emotions you did when it happened. Well, emotional amnesia is kind of like that, except opposite. You know the trauma, and but it, you have that emotional disconnect from it. For example, I remember part of my trauma. I remember it happening. And don't get me wrong, it doesn't feel, it's not like I'm, don't, it didn't affect me. It's not like I'm sitting here and I'm just like, oh yeah, it's fine, I'm, I'm great. No, it still screwed me up. 
But the fact is, when I think about it, I still have that emotional disconnect. It's not necessarily that I feel completely numb and void to it. It's that it doesn't necessarily feel like it happened to me. What most likely happened is I was extremely dissociated and had depersonalization. And it just, you don't feel that emotional connection to a memory or to a trauma that you should. Now, I used a source, um, and it is ncbi.gov, and um, I used it because, okay, sorry, um, my dog was getting into something, so I had to go take care of that. <laughs> so, I used the source ncbi.gov, and I used that source because one is a government source, and B, there's not a lot of information out there about DID, and a lot of good sources. So, one of them is that it says, studies show most individuals who meet the criteria for dissociative identity disorder have been treated in the system for 6 to 12 years before being correctly diagnosed. And what that means is, they have been being treated for some sort of psychiatric issue for 6 to 12 years before DID is diagnosed and recognized in them. And in between, that's a very long time to be in the system. For me, I'm 19 now. I've been in the mental health system since I was five years old. And they just figured out my system, my symptoms align with DID. And that can lead to a lot of time in misdiagnosis. And I have a lot more sources about misdiagnosis that I'll use in future videos. Also, I just want to add, because there are issues with people being confused about it. DID is a post-traumatic developmental disorder and it's specifically located in the DSM-5, located in the dissociative disorder section immediately after trauma disorders because they recognize it as one from trauma. Now the reason they can't specifically say it's a trauma disorder is because they'd have to test that theory and that test and it's not very much a good idea to do experiments for that theory on traumatized individuals. So everyone knows it, but they have to do technicalities. And because of that, and because of it being a PTSD-related disorder, your brain doesn't want you to know you have PTSD. Your brain doesn't want you to know you went through a trauma. Your brain doesn't want you to think about that horrible thing. So, what it does is it usually makes you more covert. Because if someone realizes you have DID, then you would also have to come to terms with something really crappy happened to you. And your brain doesn't want it. Your brain's an amazing tool. So most of the time, DID is so co covert because it, the disorder doesn't want you to know it's there. Now, I'm not saying the disorder is sentient. I'm just saying that it's specifically designed by your brain to make it like a chameleon, like to blend in so that you can't recognize it's there so everything can stay as fine as it can, so it can pretend to function so that you don't have to know what's going on. And because of covertness, especially in the media, of it not being as recognized, it can lead to a lot of imposter syndrome. And imposter syndrome, I did not think to write down the exact definition, but I know kind of about it. Imposter syndrome is when you know you have something, like for me, I'm diagnosed with DID. I know I have DID, but there's still a little part of your brain that tells you that you're faking. Over tiny little things usually. And it can be very prominent, especially in today's media, because you'll see symptoms, you, oh my lord, you'll see systems and they will be sitting there talking about how, oh, they're hearing this alter say this thing and that. And if you don't have that, if you don't have great communication, if you have horrible amnesia and you can't talk to your alters, it can lead to a bit of imposter syndrome. Oh, is this really DID? Maybe I'm just faking. Maybe they have real DID and I don't. It can lead to a lot of that. Be or if your alters aren't as vastly different and even vastly 
different altars can still be covert. Like for me, I have vastly different altars. I have, many of them have different accents. I have one that's Harley Quinn, and she has a very thick uh, New Jersey accent. She can pretend to be me perfectly because they have, because altars have, can, can, depending on the system, have such high abilities to mask and pretend to be the host. Or if they don't, sometimes they stay in more so that they don't accidentally reveal themselves. But they have such a capability to pretend to be you that you don't realize what's going on. So even if you have vastly different altars, you can still be covert because of how they act when you're out, and you can easily excuse different behaviors away if you do slip up. Now, some people don't have as vastly different altars. Some altars aren't recognizably very different, and that can still lead to a lot of imposter syndrome when you're seeing a lot of things online about all these altars who have to be 100% different and 100% out and talking and great, it can lead to a lot of imposter syndrome to the people who don't have that or struggle with not being able to function well. And it's a really big, it's a huge deal in the DID community. Almost every system that I have met has imposter syndrome to some degree. Now I'm going to be doing a video next probably about misdiagnoses and stuff like that, so I won't go too much into that. It is common though, and it does relate a lot to covertness, because being covert can lead to a lot of overlap of different disorders and symptoms and misdiagnoses, and I ramble on a lot, and I apologize for that. So I appreciate you listening in, and I hope this talk helped at all, and I hope you guys know that if you are a system and you look in the media or you look and you question yourself all the time, you are just as valid as any other system. You don't have to work and compare yourself to others in order to be your own great system. So please don't ever think you have to. Please don't ever think that you have to look at others and compare yourselves in order for your DID to be just as real as other people's. So, it has been great talking. I hope you guys have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you guys next time.